ways. Um, when he arrived, the Jews in particular, the zealots, wanted a rebellion. They wanted their savior to overturn the oppressive rule of the Romans and bring about peace through violence. But Jesus had something else in mind. He gives us inner peace, and we also have peace with others. We put aside our differences, especially with other believers, because we belong to the same family. We have the same purpose to let others know about the peace of Christ. The word for peace in Hebrew is shalom, and it goes far beyond not fighting with others or peace as we know it. Shalom is, in essence, how things are meant to be, a slice of heaven. The peace of God allows us to look at others through heaven's eyes and help, and it helps guide the world to see that God is here and that there is a kingdom that will come. So we are going to go ahead and sing the songs that remind us about the peace of Jesus this morning. Why don't you go ahead and stand with us, and we're going to get started with some worship songs to our Savior Jesus.
Jesus. You bring us peace in unexpected ways. Your peace transcends our circumstances and this world. That first Christmas, the Prince of Peace was sent for us. Thank you for your gift. Keep us in perfect peace as our minds are stayed on the truth of your love, God. Thank you for your sovereign hand. Help us to fully trust in you and rest in the peace that you offer. Jesus, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Lighthouse. You can be seated. Thank you for tuning in at home. And uh, I trust you open your heart for everyone even here under the sound of the gospel today. You open your heart and receive what God has for you today. So, We're in a series called True Virtue. Today's part four of our final part. Uh, today, I want to speak uh, to all those in this area, those that feel like quitting. Whether you've talked about it, whether you've kind of just kept it secret, uh, but you're having, you're circling the drain in your mind and you feel like quitting for whatever reason, for a reason, for those that honestly that have felt like just throwing in the towel and that's it. Throwing in the towel and that's it. Maybe it's your marriage. You feel like nothing major has happened, but you feel like it's not ever going to be right. And you have this sense about you that you're going to stop investing and stop trying. And you know that will hasten the end but you feel like quitting. You know how that goes. Maybe it's your ministry, you wanna quit. Maybe you're doing something for the Lord and you've tried and tried and you feel there's like obstacles, always obstacles, and it's just too hard and you're gonna, you're thinking about throwing in the towel. Or maybe it's quitting on your kids. I'm not talking about like throwing your kids away or anything like that, but I'm talking about, uh, You've prayed for them. You're maybe older kids. You've prayed for them. And it seems like there's no way, no way that they will ever come to Christ. It just feels that way. There's no way they will ever come to Christ. And you're kind of ready to throw in the towel. And that's it. That's it. You've kind of given up and you're ready to throw in the towel on your kids. And maybe it's a, a, an addiction. Maybe it's an addiction that's, has been nagging at you, you've tried to overcome, you've prayed about it, you've fought to get rid of it, you've tried to overcome, you've tried but you can't seem to put whatever has got its locks on you, you can't put it behind you. So, there are loads of things in our lives that cause people and cause even me to uh, want to think about quitting those things. Quitting those things and throw in the towel. So we're going to begin today with a passage from Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, if you have your Bibles or phones, Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 35. And the writer wrote this to the Hebrew Christians and he writes this. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, he says, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. And then he says, You need to persevere. Persevere, and that's the virtue. True virtue? We're talking about perseverance today. We're talking about the desire to keep going, the desire... And the perseverance, the virtue of perseverance to keep trusting, to keep believing, to hang in there, perseverance. We're talking about that. And this is what he says about that. The writer, he says this to the, to the Hebrew Christians. He said, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Folks, I hope you know that. 
God is rarely early. God is rarely early on things, but he is never late. Never is he late. He knows what he knows about our lives. Perseverance. So uh, we're talking about that subject today. Today's title is When You Feel Like Giving Up. So we're going to have a word of prayer and just ask God to speak to our hearts. And I ask you, Lord, I ask you to just open your heart today and hear what is being said about the true virtue of perseverance. Let's pray. Father, encourage our hearts, please. I ask you to do this in Jesus' name. I ask you to help us, especially, Lord, for those that have already thought about throwing in the towel. I ask you, Lord, to help us learn more, hear more, read more about the virtue of perseverance. Please help us, Lord. We love you. Thank you for how good you are to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to tell, this, uh, tell you this. Uh, it's good news. And even if you already have sort of given up, this news is this. God has more for you. That's why he's keeping you alive. Amen. Because he has more for you in this life. Whatever your gifts and abilities are, even if you don't see gifts and abilities in your life, oh, you've got them. You've got gifts and abilities, and God has more for you to use your gifts and abilities to bring honor to the Son of God in this life. And when he's done, rest assured, he will call you home when he's done with you. <laughs> so he will call you home. No worries there, folks. So God has more for you. A woman by the name of Angela Duckworth, probably nobody has heard of her, but a woman by the name of Angela Duckworth, she studied at Harvard and Oxford, and she, re she researched this question. Research this question, says, why do, why do successful people succeed? That was the question she researched. Why do successful people succeed? She researched in three different categories, why people succeed in life. The first one, it went this, for a military academy. She went to a famous military academy and researched the cadets in that military academy. Uh, and then, uh, so, yeah, there, there, I asked Pam, I took a picture of it. And uh, so, and then the next picture was this. The next picture, uh, the next place she researched was some rundown schools, inner city schools. She researched inner city schools. So, and then lastly, she researched world-class fifth grade spelling bee champions. Fifth grade spelling bee champions. And uh, there's an empty auditorium where the spelling bees took place. So, they researched this. They're, they're her, her entire team researched this. Which cadets in military school would which cadets would succeed and which ones would drop out first they would go and hunt down those that have dropped out and ask them why they dropped out and research the the their thoughts on that and then they researched they went and talked to people that were staying in and gonna stay in for the long haul and have stayed in for the long haul they researched that so why they dropped out and why they stayed and, and why so the inner city schools, they wanted to know in their research, they wanted to know which teachers were successful and which inner city schools teachers quit quickly. Because lots of them do. Inner city schools, they quit, they quit quickly. So she, they researched that. Then they researched fifth graders who could spell words with up to 72 letters in them. So... Uh, honestly, uh, I was always so mad in spelling bees. Listen, they, when I was being raised in school, they couldn't have cared less about my embarrassment. You know, that's old school stuff. They couldn't care less that I was embarrassed that I couldn't spell. And uh, so, and they would give me seven letter words and I'm just thinking, 
uh, and, and everybody else is spelling seven letter, seven letter words, but I would stand up there and I'm thinking, let's see, uh, and, and I would just give up and walk back to the, walk back to my seat and then I'd get out a box of stuff I brought and I'd just play with all that. So anyways, uh, but they weren't worried about my embarrassment, but, uh, this is what they discovered. Listen, why, why, why are some people successful? and why others, but the spelling bee kids, they wanted to find out with talent being equal across fifth graders, the good, good spelling bee, bee champions, they wanted to find out with talent being equal from kid to kid, why some rise to the top and why some kid, talent being equal, would cave to the pressure. They wanted to know that, they researched that. So why are some people successful and others aren't? This is why, this is what they discovered. They discovered this. It wasn't just IQ. It wasn't just IQ. Intelligence quotient. It wasn't just IQ. I figured, listen, I don't know how smart you are, so I better put IQ up there. <laughs> so I did that for me, really. But anyways, intelligence quotient. It wasn't just IQ. Instead, they discovered the success was largely found to be based on AQ. Success, AQ, adversity quotient. Adversity quotient. Think about that. If you think uh, that when the Lord was passing out brains, you thought he said trains, and you said, I love trains, and, and you didn't get you didn't get the uh, IQ thing, but uh, you got maybe AQ. And they found out that AQ, adversity quotient, is way better. When you're talking about succeeding in life, AQ is way, way better than IQ. So listen, I, 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 I wasn't, uh, it wasn't just how smart they were, but how much they could overcome. That's what AQ, AQ is. How much can you overcome? Not IQ, but AQ. This Angela Duckworth wrote in a book about, uh, uh, wrote in a book about grit. It's the, one of the titles of the book, Grit in People. Grit, G-R-I-P. Almost sounds like an old-fashioned cowboy word. But she wrote about grit, this, this brilliant lady, and the book she writes is it, it, it writes this about she ta I, I took a quote from the book and the quote says this about grit grit is passion and perseverance for long-term goals grit let me read that again grit is passion and perseverance for long-term goals passion and perseverance working in concert passion and perseverance working in concert for long-term goals. So this is not short-term passion and perseverance. It's not short-term that you just hold your breath and hopefully it goes away. Uh, this is long-term passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Listen, it's not just finishing one semester. And you say, well, I have passion. I have perse uh, perseverance. I finished one semester. This is long-term passion. This is A-G stuff. A-G stuff. Listen, we're talking about raising a special needs child. Mm -hmm. Buddy, you're in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. You're in it for the long haul. You're just not looking at the age 18 and say, I cannot wait till they get out of my house. Mm -hmm. Buddy, a special needs child needs care for a long, long time. So we're talking about that. We're talking about finishing well when things are difficult. Finishing well when things are difficult. Perseverance, perseverance. So let's look at a powerful story. It's a powerful story uh, in, in the Old Testament. It may give us all some desire and faith to press on when we think about some of these things and it when it would be easier to quit, this story. So let's look at Joshua chapter six. If you could flip and find that in your, in your Bible, on your phone. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua is the sixth book of the Old Testament, uh, starting, in, starting in Genesis. Six books of the Old Testament. 
six books in the Old Testament. So please know that God had promised to give the city of Jericho. Anybody that knows a little bit about this, God had promised to give the city of Jericho to uh, Israel when Israel was promised the promised land, the promised land. And that was the first city they came to in the promised land as they marched in. So Joshua chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says this. It says, Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. They were locked up. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. Jer Joshua, Moses had died. Joshua now is the leader of Israel, the nation Israel. It says no one was allowed to go out again, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. And, he, and then he said this, and this is your assignment. This is the nation Israel going to battle now with Jericho. And they have a massive wall. And this is what God's telling them. This is the assignment. This is what I want you to do. All you warriors in Israel, this is what I want you to do. It says this in verse 4. Seven priests will walk ahead of the, will walk ahead of the ark each carrying a ram's, ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times, but the priest blowing the horns, uh, with the priest blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Now you think about that. That's their big battle plan. Just walk. That's their battle plan. Folks, the assignment was simple. If you think about that, the assignment was simple. Walk around the walls one time a day, and on the seventh day, walk around, walk around the walls one time a day, and then return to the camp. And then on the seventh day, walk around seven times, blow your horns, and then shout, and then shout, and the walls will come tumbling down. So why do we give up, as you think about this, why do we give up when God has promised us so much? Why do we give up? That should be the last thing we think about, but it's not, starting with me. It's not, I've thought about throwing in the towel in a lot of ways, throwing in the towel. So why do we lose our trust in God's promises. Why do we lose our trust? In your notes, there are two reasons I put in there. Two reasons I put in there, and they're very common reasons. They're not hard to understand, but I've seen myself in these reasons. That's why I just, I have confidence in these reasons why people give up. So why do we give up? Number one, in your notes, because our pers perspective is often limited. Our perspective is often limited. Uh, let's, uh, let, let's say a word about Jericho as we think about Jericho. Jericho is not a big city. It's not. It's not a big city. You could march around Jericho in about an hour. Uh, they say you can march around it in about an hour and 20 minutes. It's not a big, big landmass city. The city was not so big, but the walls were extremely high. You think about that. The walls were extremely high. So the Israelites were close to, to, to the promise of victory. They were. Listen, they had been through so many things, and now it's the first city that God presents to them. They come across the Jordan. Now it's the first city that their, God is going to begin to give them the land. The promised land. So, Israelites were close to the promise of victory, but these walls were so high, and victory seemed impossible because of the stupid walls. 
the walls. All the Israelites saw in this scenario, all they saw were the walls. The walls. Too big, too thick, too bad. Too bad. The story of Jericho, honestly, is most relatable to me and honestly many people that read it. It's most relatable in our lives because walls are what many of us see in our lives. When things happen in our life and we're presented with challenges and stuff, many times all we can see is like, uh, yep, that'll never happen. I've said those words. Yep, oh, that's great. Power to the people. That'll never happen. That'll never happen because all I saw was walls. Saw walls. Many of what we see in our life are walls. We know what we want to be. I mean, we know what we want in life. Many of us know what we want in life, even where God wants us to be. We know that. We know that. We have insight into that. But what we see is that which, uh, is, that which is keeping us from that promise. That's what we see. That which is keeping us from those ideas, what God has for us, that's what we see. That which is keeping us from that promise. Maybe it's to get out of debt. You think about this. Maybe it's to get out of debt. That's what you want to do. I am tired of this strangulation of debt in our life. And you, you say, I'm going to get out of debt. You say, that's what I want to do this year, 2023, we are going to get out of debt. The very next day, your car breaks down, your transmission goes kaput, and your fridge breaks. And I really like food, so the fridge is really serious business. So, your fridge breaks. $5,000 later, all you see is walls. All you see is walls, especially if you don't have $5,000. So all you see is walls. You see the idea in your head and your heart and the promise that this year we are going to be a family that honors Christ. A family that honors Christ and we are going to make church a priority. Oh, we're going to make church a priority. Then on the way to church, an argument ensues with your family. I don't, you probably never, we've had several in our family. An argument ensues in our family and you cuss at the kids the last five minutes of the trip. You just can't stop. You're on a roll now and you're just cussing the kids. And as you get out of the car at church, you're thinking, well, that didn't go so well. That didn't go so well and uh, we'll maybe have to start next Sunday and honoring the Lord with our family. So, starting with uh, me, you know, that type of thing. So, you see some very high walls. Like, this is very difficult. And as you see is walls. So, you try to mend a broken relationship. You say, I'm going to do the right thing. Lord, help me. Give me the words. And you meet this person, whether it's a family member or whether it's a friend. You meet them at, uh, to, uh, you meet them at, uh, uh, the restaurant, Applebee's. And you're trying to reason with them and you're trying to restore. You have honorable intention. And a shouting match breaks out at Applebee's now. Shouting match breaks out and it breaks out and Applebee's finally comes over and asks you to leave. <clears throat> asks you to leave. Sir, we have a good business here and your mouth is ruining it. So, all you can see is walls at this point. Well, that goes, that, 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 that's out the window. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to restore. That, that person's an idiot, even though you were shouting back. So, all you see is walls around you. Folks, we give up many times because our perspectives are limited. Our perspectives are limited. Think back to Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. It says the walls were tightly shut. That's what the first verse says. The walls were tightly shut, and no one went in or out. They were locked down big time. And then verse 2 says this. But the Lord, 
uh, but the Lord has given you Jericho. Now think about that. Verse 1, Jericho is locked up tight. Verse 2, I've given you Jericho. Huh, I've given you Jericho, the walls are locked up tight, we can't get in. All right, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. God says that. Why is God, what, 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 why did God say that? I'm going to tell you, this is why I think. Because God is the only one who can tell you, God is the only one who can tell you what's going to happen before it happens. God is the only one that can tell you that in your heart. What's going to happen before it happens? God is the one that can do it before it actually happens. I wonder how often that happens in our lives where what God says about us, what God says about us is different than what we than what we see in our own life. What God says about us is different than what we think in our own lives. What God says about us. For instance, God might say this, and God says this in Scripture to us, to Christ followers. He says this. If God says you're blessed, he says you're blessed. This is what we say about ourselves. <laughs> well, I don't feel very blessed. Same thing. I don't feel very blessed. And God might say this to you. In John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, uh, uh, you're an overcomer. That's what that scripture says. He tells Christ followers that you're overcomers now because of the Christ that lives within you. He tells us that. But you feel about yourself, and mainly, mostly, you feel this secretly. But you say, yeah, I'm an overcomer. I'm overcome almost every day with almost everything. Something comes into my life every day that overcomes me and runs me over and then puts it in reverse and backs over me. That's the way I feel about certain things. Why is that? Because our perspective is often limited. It's limited, our perspective. Like the Israelites at the wall, they don't know the end of the story. They've heard and they've heard uh, what a jo the, the God spoke these things to Joshua, but they don't know the end of the story. All they know is Joshua said this, we're going to walk every day. Walk every day? What's the battle plan? What's the strategy? Walk. And then return to the camp. Walk. What kind of stupid, stupid plan? is that we're going to take a walk every day. God told Joshua these things that's going to happen, but he didn't tell them. He didn't tell the nation. He told Joshua this. All he told them was to get up on Monday and walk around the city. That's what he told them. That's what Joshua said. We're going to get up Monday and we're going to walk around the city and then return to the camp. Then Tuesday, same thing. Then Wednesday, the same thing. Then Thursday, the same thing. Then Friday, the same thing. And then Saturday, the same thing. We're going to walk. And honestly, this is why God had to kill people. He would have smacked me with my big fat mouth. On Thursday, I'd have been going, hey, watch me walk. Watch me walk. We're taking this city. On this stupid trip around the city. We're going to kill him. Here's my sword. He said, that's what we're going to do. And then he said, on the seventh, God told him, on the seventh day, we're going to walk seven times around. We're going to walk seven times around. And then he said, the walls are going to come tumbling down. That's what God told Joshua. Those who grew up in Sunday school... Can you, can you remember a song written about this? Those who grew up in Sunday school said it goes like this, honestly, for those that were heathen during those years. But <laughs> if you grew up in Sunday school, the song goes, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Tell me, if you ever knew that song, would you raise your hand? Let me say, oh, holy mackerel. So, a lot of people, yeah. So, but that's what the song, 
Uh, I, I, that's what the song uh, was written about this battle. And I want to tell you, folks, I want to tell you for sure, Joshua would have hated that stupid song. <laughs> Joshua would have hated, hated that song because there was so much more to it, that battle, than singing that stupid song. <laughs> so much more to it than that. This Jericho conflict was at the tail end of 40 years in the wilderness. And they crossed, the, he saw them stop the waters of the Jordan. They all saw it. They crossed the waters of the Jordan River. It's like the Swatera Creek, the Jordan River. That's really what it's like. So I saw it. And, uh, and they crossed that river. God stopped the flow. And they crossed it. And then the first town they come to is Jericho. Jericho! First time they come to. Listen, this conflict, conflict with them in Israel has been going on. They've been in the desert and the wilderness, and now they're finally going to do battle. After all those years, decades and decades of conflict, watching, watching nothing happen in the wilderness, now they're arriving at Jericho. They are wound. They are locked and loaded. And all they're going to do is take a walk. They're going to take a walk. Where are you, God? They had to have been asking, where are you, God? Where's the victory of this promised land? We've been all lathered up and ready to go. We've been telling our kids. Our ancestors told us this, is this and this and this. And that's going to happen. Where is the victory that you promised? And Joshua said, we're going to take a walk. We're going to take a walk for six days. Listen, we're still here, God. We're still here. Where's the victory? Waiting for you to lead us past this first city. This was their life for years just hanging on, waiting for God to give them the land. So it is in our life. I want you to think about that. So it is in our lives. We look at others and think that they have it made. We do. We look at others. That's our almost our American famous past line, pastime. Looking at others and thinking they have it made. They have it made. Uh, and God gave them the victory. When is it our turn to see God move? He moves there, or maybe they're making it up, and I'm believing it. But, but when is it our turn? But no one knew what price was paid for the victory that went on in Jericho. No one knew the price that the Israelites paid in the wilderness. They paid a hefty price to get to where they are at. The pain they endured, the perseverance of hanging on for 40 plus years hanging on to get to this point and now this is the big instruction from our fearless leader Joshua we're going to walk we're going to walk no one knows the story behind the story the private battles were huge private battles it all looks so easy as we look on at someone else's life and someone else's good fortune, someone else's victory. It all looks so easy. Many times it boils down to just this, perseverance. Perseverance. No one tells that. If someone interviews you, say, what do you owe your success? Well, uh, let's say uh, uh, perseverance. That is so boring for an interview. So boring. No one tells that. Perseverance. That's the price of victory many times. Perseverance. The virtue of perseverance. So why do we give up? So often it's because, number one, our perspective is limited. Our perspective is limited. And then in our notes, number two, why do we give up? Our progress isn't always obvious. Our progress is not always obvious. So that's why we give up. Please look again at Joshua chapter 6, verse 10. It says this, And Joshua had commanded the army, 
of Israel. It says, do not give a war cry as you walk. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the <laughs> army returned to the camp and spent the night there. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. Think about that. Now, can you imagine they're marching? Now, Joshua says, you need to keep your mouth shut when you march. <laughs> keep your mouth shut. Keep your comments to yourself. Can you imagine their thoughts with this stupid assignment? He said, keep your mouth shut about it. This stupid assignment, walking and waiting and keeping your mouth shut while you walk. Folks, this wasn't just six days of waiting. It wasn't six days of waiting. This was decades of waiting for God to move. Folks, almost all of us can endure if we see some progress in our life. Almost all of us can endure if we see some progress. Listen, if you're a big deal this year, if you've been trying to lose weight, it's encouraging and you can almost endure the process if you're tightening those belt loops. You can almost endure that if you see a little progress. Or savings. If you look at your savings, and you, you can almost endure cutting corners, not going out to eat if you keep your eye on the prize, our savings is growing. Or we paid this bill off. I can't argue. You can endure more if you see the progress. Or if your marriage is getting better, you're struggling in your marriage, and you finally start to smile at each other. Mm -hmm. And you're talking again. And you're thinking, hey, I'm going to keep on going and see what happens. We're at least talking. You see progress. All these Israelites did, uh, listen, but all these Israelites did was take a stroll around a huge wall for six days. Take a stroll around a huge wall for six days. And then he said, men, you're not allowed to talk. Why? Why would you think? Maybe it's because their mouth many times becomes their worst enemy. Not only them, but also maybe because our mouth becomes our worst enemy. Our worst enemy! Think about that. Negative, complaining. Think about, I thought, Joshua was smarter than that to take our entire army, get us all lathered up, and then say, walk around the city one time and go back to camp, and then uh, play spades. We got some cards, card decks waiting for you. You can just play spades and kill time. And then we'll do that for six days. I thought Joshua was smart. Why, why are we just taking a walk? Why are we doing that? He's as dumb. Joshua gotta be as dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> dumb. This is my, someone would say, they weren't allowed to say this, but this is what some maybe would say. This is my last way, walk. I'm sleeping in tomorrow. What a huge waste of time. How about it? How about it, Joe? Huh? How about it, Don? Let's sleep in tomorrow. I'm not getting out there and walking again. This is so stupid. So, 40 years we've been walking, and my feet hurt. And I'm done. I came to fight. I didn't come to walk. I didn't come to walk. But folks, sometimes we just have to shut our trap and keep walking when God's trying to teach us something. When we're going through something, keep our mouth shut and keep walking that's what requires that's what's required sometimes keep trusting keep praying keep loving keep forgiving and keep showing up keep showing up why because perseverance matters perseverance matters the virtue of perseverance Folks, God told Joshua this. He told Joshua the process would take seven days. He told Joshua this 
But Joshua didn't tell all the people that. The process, this is going to be a seven-day process, and uh, we're going to walk. He said, go walk, come on back to the camp. I'll give you instruction tomorrow. So, folks, I know that you know, I know you know this, that it's frustrating when you're doing the right thing and it doesn't make a difference. Oh, that's the most frustrating, when you're doing the right thing and it doesn't make a difference. Because that's when we should really try and keep our mouth shut because the propensity for me to speak up at that point, when you're doing the right thing and it doesn't make a difference. Oh, I need to tell those people what I'm doing because maybe they didn't catch it that I'm doing the right thing and I'm the more wonderful person. I need to tell them that. Listen, it's such an easier thing to stay the course when, when we see a little progress along the way. So where is God in times like this? Where is God in times like this? Folks, these, these are faith-building times. Honestly, I'm old now, and we've had lots of times like that in Donna and I's life. Faith-building times. Building faith muscles. Time to grow and mature. When I didn't have a clear plan. Oh, I so desperately wanted a clear plan in my life. But it didn't work that way many, many times. And they were faith-building times. Actually, I'm where I'm at right now, and I look back and say, wow, I, 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 I was walking blindly, and God somehow maneuvered us through all those things. Time to grow and mature. Time to learn and depend on Him. I've heard this said about faith-building times. This said, and that's why I put it in your notes. It says this, God often does something in you before he does something for you. Mm -hmm. Does something in you before he does something for you. So that's been a storyline in my own life. Loads of times asking God to work as we marched around the wall, as we walked around the wall and prayed and asked God, please do this or do that. I have no idea where we're going with this. Waiting for God to tear down the walls, trying to obey while we wait. Trying to obey while we wait. And in his time, God shows up. Not in our time. Now, I hate that. Yeah. But in his time, God shows up. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. I'll read it again. We've already read it. It says, you need to, to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised when you've done the will of God. Folks, wait on the Lord. You may be closer than you think. Closer than you think. There's a woman by the name of Florence Chadwick. Now, I've read about her a long time ago. Florence Chadwick, she, she was an absolute amazing woman. Uh, Florence Chadwick. She was the first woman back in the day, first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. Those are rough, rough waters. She was the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. Incredible accomplishment. Then she set her sights on this, to jump into the ocean in California. In 1952, Chadwick decided to attempt a 26-mile swim between the California coastline and the Catalina Islands. I don't know if anybody has ever seen them or been there, but it's a it's a 26 mile swim. She's swimming 15 hours into the grueling swim. A heavy fog set in, and she started struggling which direction is right, even though she had a boat not too far off. And they were yelling to her, "Keep going, keep going, uh, uh, Florence." And, uh, and she kept going for a while, and that was the only way she kept straight in the water because the fog was thick and she was disoriented. So she kept going for a while. Her coaches from the boat kept shouting, keep going, Florence, please keep going. You're almost there. Florence couldn't take it any longer. 
by the way, last page for anybody counting on this. Florence couldn't take it any longer. Couldn't take it any longer. And she threw in the towel and climbed in the boat. In all her pain, she climbed in the boat. And immediately as she laid in the boat, she was surrounded by voices. And then she poked her head up over the, the, the boat she was in and saw the shoreline a half a mile away. Wow. Saw the shoreline a half a mile away, a half a mile away to accomplish this crazy, crazy feat that was publicized everywhere. A half a mile away. Folks, perseverance is a virtue that will engage us and help us through if you have the virtue of perseverance. It will help us succeed in this life. That's what made the difference they discovered in the military academy when all those people dropped and those that stayed, perseverance. That's what in the spelling bee in fifth graders, when the pressure grew so heavy, they said perseverance in those fifth graders, those are the ones that won the spelling bee. They were all smart. But the ones that had perseverance hung in there. And he said, inner city schools, when many teachers are circling the drain, the ones that have perseverance and say, no, I'm going to stay. I'm going to do this. Perseverance. They're the ones that stayed and found great success. That's what that study found. It will help all of us. Perseverance perseverance invite it in read about it embrace it practice it cherish it galatians chapter 6 verse 9 it says let us not become weary in well-doing for at a proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up when you feel like giving up persevere persevere the end let's pray father we love you as you've already started with me lord you know that i never cherished the idea because i didn't have a high iq but lord somehow some way you have given me a good dose of AG. AG. And I've desired to do this, Lord. I've desired to persevere for you, Lord, because of who you are. I ask you, Lord, for those here today that would say, Pastor, I do. I feel like there, there's times that I've given up on this and that. And I've developed that in my life. And I don't want any part of it. I want to develop a load. A boatload of AG in my life. I need AG. I need perseverance in my life. I ask you, Lord, for those that feel that, sense that, and desire that. I ask you to help them, Lord. Starting today, help us. Give us the courage to hang in there and persevere. It's a virtue quality that will help us when we're knocked down to get back up again. The Bible says a good man is knocked down seven times but rises up again. Help us, Lord, to develop that in our life. Perseverance. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, why don't you go ahead and stand with us? We're going to put um, one last song in here. God with us.
Jesus, you are with us. Help us to feel that even when it's so very hard to feel that at times because of fear or anxiety. We know you have come to bring peace. Help us to be people that pursues you and pursues peace. We love you, Jesus. You are King and Lord. In your name.